What is going on, everybody? Welcome. I know it's Medical Sales Live, but technically this is MedTech Marketing Live. Welcome to the stream. Glad you can all be here. I'm your host, Omar M. Khatib. I'm so happy. I'm so happy to be doing the stream. I'll tell you why. Yes, I do love salespeople, but you all know me. I'm a marketer. And so running ads, driving revenue, reducing sales timelines, like these are the things we live for. And, you know, MedTech has changed. MedTech has changed um, quite a lot. And before I bring on my guest, all right, I see a lot of uh, people joining. Jeffrey Beecher, hey, welcome, welcome. Glad you can join. LinkedIn user, I don't know who this is because you're private. They're unavailable. Will there be a recording? Of course there's going to be a recording. Come on. This is the first time you've been on the show? Of course. There's always going to be a recording. Always going to be a recording. So we'll give it a couple minutes. I know that people are just rolling in Jeffrey right now. Jeffrey Beecher, hey, well. All right. looks like my sound is good. And I'm going to turn on one extra light. So our agenda for today um, is going to cover a big topic for a lot of med tech marketers, which is now that hospital access has gone away, right? Um, how, how do we help our sales team? How do we drive revenue, right? Um, conferences have been hit as well. And so using the digital world, using digital and demand gen strategies is really the key, but it's difficult. We live in a highly regulated environment. Plus we're dealing with planet Earth's most skeptical and difficult customer to reach, which is the surgeon, right? Joshua Day, all right. J look at that. See, that's MedTech for you. Joshua Day joining us, but he's currently standing in a case right now uh, while watching this. What other live stream has people joining from surgery? It's only this one. Fantastic. Jackie, thank you so much for joining. Fantastic. So my special guests, there's a lot of agencies out there. I've, I've evaluated so many. A lot of them say they can do good demand gen. They can drive demos. They really can. There's one, my friends, one that really stood out to me, and that's the great uh, group at Impactable. I have to mention this. This is not a paid webinar. This is not a sponsored webinar. I actually invited them on because I was going to run this myself, and I said, I really want the people who I think are the best at this. So Impactable is specifically a LinkedIn ads agency. They're very good at what they do. They're so good that I personally use them, um, not just for clients, but for my own stuff. So when you guys see the ads for uh, my my webinars, everything, I actually use them. So I'm going to bring them on one at a time. So let me bring on uh, the founder and CEO, Justin Rowe. Hi, Justin. Can you hear us? Can you see us? I can hear you and see you. And thanks for uh, having me on. Absolutely. My pleasure. My pleasure. And next, and if you guys can introduce yourselves and your and your uh, titles, titles, I hate saying that, but you know, I don't know what else to say. JD Garcia. Hey everybody, pleasure to be here. I am head of product strategy slash sales slash um, search, uh, a little bit of everything here at Impactable. Fantastic, fantastic. And last but not least, Josh Stout. Hey Josh, how's it going? Hey everybody, I'm uh, Josh. I'm the director of operations for Impactable and I'm glad to be here today. Very, very happy to have you guys here as well. Now, as always, it's only a couple minutes into the stream, so we have some people joining late. That's totally okay. We're going to give it one quick minute before, as we introduce the topics. Uh, for those who are joining, we have some special giveaways. One is Impactable is going to be having their um, the, the, the playbook that essentially we're going to go through. We're going to make it available to everybody, so you're getting that. Some of you might get lucky and win some other prizes. Uh, but first of all, because I see the stream, a lot of people are joining. Welcome. If you're new to the show... Let me introduce you to a very important part of the show. You have to drop in. What city are you joining in? So please drop in the chat. I see people chatting, which is great. I want to know what city you're joining in from. So while we're uh, waiting for people to just join and uh, share, gentlemen, where are you guys joining from? I'm joining from uh, sunny Southern California. Justin, how about you? I'm currently living in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Just moved here last year from Louisville, Kentucky. Fantastic. Josh, how about you? Also sunny and very hot San Antonio, Texas. I uh, wouldn't mind uh, a little bit of rain, actually. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And JD, how about you? Uh, from very far away, San Antonio, Texas as well. <laughs> also Got it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Oh, fantastic. And see, I love marketers. Look at that. We got a lot of people already jumping in. So let me let me give some shout outs. My good friend, Rena Mishra from San Jose, California. Hey, Rena, thanks for joining. Jeff Cowles from Erie, Colorado. Hey, Megan McClenter. I hope I pronounced that right. From the Jersey Shore. Welcome. You know, the Jersey Shore cast went through my hometown of El Paso, Texas. I don't watch the Jersey Shore, but I watched that episode. Uh, LinkedIn user from Boston, Massachusetts, who I can't see, unfortunately, because you're set to private. That's okay. I'm still going to shout you out. Sujit. Hey, Sujit. It's from San Mateo. Thank you for joining. Eric from Seattle, Washington. Eric Salvatierra. What a great name. Look at that one. Um, Michelle Martin from Incline Village, Nevada. I don't even know where that is. Incline Village. We have uh, Simon Evans from Wonk Wokingham, United Kingdom. Jeffrey Beecher, I'm currently in Virginia, dot, dot, dot. Okay, another LinkedIn here coming from Texas, and we'll do one last one. Tony Embry from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So, ladies and gentlemen, so we'll get started with a topic. Um, we'll introduce the topic. I'm going to pull up my screen. We're going to go through the playbook. But as we go through this, we're going to go through this maybe for maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, but we're going to get right away into Q&A. So, marketers, Please take advantage of this. This is the world's number one ranked LinkedIn agency. And they don't say that. I'm going to say that on their behalf. They are very good. I've really put them through hell over the last couple of months. One, in terms of managing my ads, but also to see, like, can I actually recommend these guys? They're very good at what they do. They don't do anything else. They focus purely on LinkedIn. Shane Jones. Shane Jones coming in from Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks, James, for, Shane, for joining. So, Justin... Maybe we can start by you introducing the topic, and then I'll share my screen. We'll start walking through the playbook. Um, yeah, so LinkedIn ads is obviously our core passion, the main thing we do. And at the heart of it is kind of our approach to LinkedIn ads and just marketing in general is right in line with like the kind of demand gen movement. And a lot of people, when they think of demand gen, they think of it as more of an organic kind of play that you're putting in this organic effort to generate demand. They don't think of it as something that you could do with ads. Um, and so the way we do it um, is, is in our retargeting strategy is kind of the fundamental what we do different. For instance, we run cold traffic to the website and LinkedIn's really good for that because you can target by position title, company size, industry, geography. It's it's way more specific than uh, Facebook, um, you know, unless you're bringing in your own audience, uh, which is usually the best way to do that. But then where we differ is what we do with the retargeting. And in my mind, there's three main objections to overcome, you know, why didn't someone buy on their first visit? Well, if you think about it, like if you're in med tech, if you're in B2B, there's no one that's really impulse shopping on their first visit. Yes, mm -hmm. they showed some curiosity, but it's either not the right time or they don't trust you yet or they don't view you as the expert. And, you know, in med tech, I'm, I'm sure it's as true as in any of these others that we deal with is that trust is a pretty big factor in the equation. So mm -hmm. we use, you know, any any ads that you put in front of someone after they leave your website, it would overcome the first objection of timing because it'll have your logo, it'll have your name. So if timing was the only objection, sure, you could put anything in front of them. So I believe it's better to put your time and energy into overcoming the other two objections. How can we make them trust us more? How can we show them that we are the experts? And we use ads to do that by showing them things like case studies, client testimonials, uh, results, uh, expert advice, videos that show off our expertise. So we're not just hitting them over the head with sales pitches. We're using paid ads as a a guaranteed delivery method to put things in front of them that help tell the story that we are the trusted experts and when and if you have a need, we should be the ones that, you know, are your go-to. And so it sounds very logical when you think about it, but it's definitely far different than what the typical advertising agency uh, is doing in terms of hitting them with ads and then just hammering them with, you know, the same kind of retargeting ads. Absolutely. And I think that's a really good point to bring up. And I think that a lot of med tech, first of all, I mean, I, I always mention this, I think med tech is one of the most difficult uh, places to market and sell because we are dealing with planet Earth's most skeptical customer, which is a physician, especially surgeons. Um, and I think this concept of leading with authority and education to gain that trust is so important. I mean, look, per I'm a perfect example of that. 
I converted again. I've had like every marketer and every marketer who's on here knows what I'm talking about. We get hit up all the time by different agencies, lead gen services, etc. Um, the reason why I became, you know, a customer started using you guys was that a all of you are very good at sharing great educational content on lead gen ads, LinkedIn ads, all these things. And by the way, for everybody uh, who's who's on here, make sure to follow all these gentlemen. The second thing is, I would see your ads where you were essentially walking through workflows on how to how I would solve a certain problem. Right. And I think so much, so too often than not in med tech, what we try and do is get the demo, but we don't give a reason why that person's going to sit on a demo, you know? And I think there's a way to demonstrate that trust and authority ahead of time on how to solve a problem in a new way and using ads. So, with that being said, what do you guys think? Should we jump over to the, uh, to the Blackboard? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So, let me um, arrange my desk here because things are falling all over the place <laughs> of course this is a great show but it's not it's not a high production show high it's quality live, right yeah high quality exactly this is the kind of thing that happens when you go live it's high quality not high production but that's okay all right <laughs> so let me uh see here and for those who are asking i'm getting a lot of people asking yes this is being recorded so you can watch this again you can take the stream send it to your um to your colleagues be sure to do that and and again if you like what we're doing do us a favor throw some emojis up reshare this broadcast live right now so if everybody could do that it's a huge help for us right we want to help as many people as possible all right here we go and for those who have epilepsy i might have just given you a seizure with that i apologize okay great can you guys see my uh can you guys see my screen I can. Yes. I can. Yes. Okay. I Please like, wait, don't 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 go quiet on me that for that long. That's I was like, oh no, answer. we lost this. We, I lost them. Okay, great, great. Right so so let's 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 start here. I mean, guys, you 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 uh, tell me tell me what to point at. And you guys run with it. One of Jonathan, you want to take this first one? Uh, sure. So what you're looking at here is a playbook, or out of our playbook, a play for a strategy between $500 to $1,000 a month uh, budget. At that budget level, so LinkedIn has a restriction or a limit on the daily budget amount of $10 per day. So if you were running, let's say, two campaigns with a three calendar month, you would spend roughly at least $600 uh, per, per month. So this, and we're looking at ourselves yes. in a mirror. <laughs> yes. So, sorry. <laughs> Let me, I'm just changing a banner. So this is good. This is fine. Let I told you guys, this is, this is, this is a uh, high quality, not high production. <laughs> I guess it is high production, you know? <laughs> yeah. But what you're looking, you're looking at here is, is kind of a, a very basic funnel. So if you've considered using LinkedIn ads or you wanted to try something in kind of the past, we didn't have an idea on what you could run. This would be a good strategy that you could implement. So you'll see kind of the first, first initial cold layer is a single image ad, which would be just kind of a sponsored content. It would be an image with some intro copy, a headline, and a call to action where you would be directing people to, let's say, a website. And at that layer, where you're at the very cold layer, you're dealing with people that really don't know that you exist. Now, if you work for a big company and you have brand recognition, you know, they, they, they might, but maybe for not what you were necessarily offering, or if you are smaller, they have no idea who you are. So you're looking at, you know, how do you introduce yourself to them? And there's kind of three ideas that you can utilize here. One, talking about the main pain point that you solve for. So the, not necessarily the product itself, but the pain point that you're helping to uh, solve for, touching on that, any services that you offer or the results that come from working with you. At this layer, what you're trying to do is you're not trying to book a demo. You're not trying to get someone to convert right away. You're just trying to get them interested enough so that they engage. And that engagement can take the form of a like, it could be a comment, it could be them clicking see more, it could be them clicking to see who liked it, it could be them actually going over to your website directly. So you're just trying to get different levels of engagement at this level, and you're going to run the majority of your budget here. Now, once they've engaged, you look over to the right, you see a 90 day retargeting layer. 
So this 90 day retargeting layer is going to be comprised of a few main buckets. One, it'll be people that have visited your LinkedIn company page because you have the ability to track that. It'll be people that visit your website if you have the pixel installed into the global footer of your website. And three, it'll be people that have engaged with the content that you've shared at your cold layer. You can then capture all of that data and all of those individuals, and you can pull them into a retargeting campaign where you can now get in front of all of them. Now, we've kind of talked about this already. Justin mentioned it. For B2B buyers specifically, they're not impulse shopping. The buying cycles are much longer. And what mm -hmm. you're trying to do is you want to educate people along the way. A good way to do that is to stay in front of them over a longer period of time, which is why it's important to pull them over into retargeting. At this budget layer where you kind of have your toe in the water and you don't want to spend a whole lot of money if you're testing this out, text ads would be a good option for you to introduce these different options here, or different content options. If you run them Jonathan. as- Oh, sorry. sorry. So, 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 so sorry to interrupt, but I, I do, I, I already, I can already feel uh, a question coming. So quick question. And this is yeah. something that's so important because I think immediately, and again, I'll speak for my industry. They very quickly jump to trying to do like some retargeting, but I just want to, I want to make sure I highlight a key point you made here, which is the initial cold layer, right? which focuses on just three things, which is either a pain point, the service you offer, and a result. Something I want to ask you guys is that just historically, and you guys work with, I know you guys work with some med tech companies. You also work with SaaS and tech. Between the three of these, what do you normally, if you had to pick one to start with, what do you usually recommend? I'll let Justin or Josh take that one. I typically like to highlight the pain point um, that you solve. It's it's the high level benefits, right? It's, it's very specifically in the med tech um, industry. It's it's highlighting what your product or service is going to be helping the most with. Um, I actually one of my longest running clients is in med tech, and this is the exact type of strategy. Um, obviously, we'll see that a, a little bit later in the playbook of, of what we do for him, but. Um, Typically, those are the ads that we're leading with is what is the, the main pain that we're able to solve and what makes it unique for that client. Got it. Got it. Justin, would you agree? Yeah, I would. And the thing I would add is, um, I mean, and, and if you've seen our ads, some of them are kind of like funny or clever, but I don't get too cute or clever with the cold ads. Like to me, those should be pretty straightforward. Um, I I honestly like the main services you offer going, you know, very clear or the main, you know, pain points. I think results could be, you know, probably even moved into the retargeting. But sometimes if you have a good, you know, image or visual, that's good. But um, the pain points is really good. And because really what you're looking for here, you shouldn't even hope for a conversion or someone to like see this ad and click into your website and and it's, they just like instantly convert and throw uh. money at you. <laughs> I want to, uh, yeah. So I want to, I want to high just again emphasize what you just said. The goal is not to get a conversion. Am I right? Yeah, correct. Uh, the goal is to let me pull up my. See, you know, the people who are watching, they have to understand. I spend like four hundred bucks on Amazon Prime Day just to get these iPads for you. I hope you guys are enjoying it because I'm having a good time. But the whole point <laughs> is not to convert into a lead or anything not even to capture an email it's to get them to the website because there you can actually pixel them and that's what's the retargeting correct yeah the the main goal is to you're putting your ads in front of your ideal prospect and if you can track signs of intent which yeah the website is a sign of intent you know if they interact with your cold ad if they visit your company page if it's a video and they watch 75 percent of that the main thing is you're harvesting data, uh, intent data that you're paying for. And that's the most expensive part of LinkedIn ads is putting cold ads in front of, um, you know, cold audience and getting that initial intent data of that. They have digitally raised their hand and said, sure, I'm curious about what you're selling, or I have that pain point, or that's something that, you know, I'd be interested in learning more about. And yeah, they click into the website and that's, that's good enough for me at that point, because it's the retargeting layer that we then go to work and would expect to, you know, convert them over the next however many months. And, and keep in mind, that's really important for optimization as well. 
um, there's there's separate stages to this. So when you're optimizing this initial cold layer, you're optimizing for engagement, which ads are resonating with your target audience, what speaks to them, what's bringing them in, what's creating that engagement. You'll worry about optimizing for conversions later down the process. But at this initial cold layer, you are looking for what's bringing in the most traffic and what's getting the interest of my target audience. Um, one other thing I think it's really important to discuss um, from, from something you said, Omar, is LinkedIn came out with a awesome feature where you no longer have to rely on the pixel of website traffic. So it doesn't replace the pixel. You want to make sure you're getting not only LinkedIn traffic, but traffic from maybe Google or Facebook or any other marketing platforms you may be using. But LinkedIn now has the ability where you can set up a retargeting audience or a matched audience based on people that have interacted with your ads. Got it. Yeah. And I, that was actually, you know, what's interesting is that was actually something that I, I learned from you guys and I started using because a lot of times as a marketer, when you launch, let's say an ad set, and again, I, I, for people, I see people, more people joining, which is great. And for those who are asking, if you're watching this on the phone, simply take your phone and flip it sideways and it'll get bigger. <laughs> so that way you can see things. Um, but again, to emphasize what, it, what, what, what uh, the, the guys are saying here, um, oops, let me go back here, is if you're going to run a single image cold layer ad, start with a pain point, the goal is driving them to the website, right? But uh, uh, um, Josh, you're, what you were mentioning right now is that in running an ad, let's say I'm testing three or five, let's say five different image images on a pain point. You're saying that even in that test while I'm figuring out which image is best, I can then take the winning image and then retarget everyone who interacted with all the images, correct, within LinkedIn. You can get the, the information from knowing like this is the winning image and this is what's catching my target audience's attention so I can make more ads like that, right? You are driving down the cold ads to figure out which cold ads are resonating the most, but you also want to try to figure things out. If you see two ads are outperforming your other ads, let's say you started with five and two are outperforming the others, there's something about those ads that really speaks to that audience. So in that case, we typically do things like we might A-B test them. We might duplicate the ad and try a different set of text or a different image, figure out what is it exactly that's resonating with the target audience. And we can continue driving down on figuring out what's most successful for us in those mm. ads and then trying to replicate that success to continue getting that high level of engagement that you want. Got it. Got it. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to go back over to Jonathan. So Jonathan, can you take back over, um, you know, after we've again, focused on a pain point, single image ad, the goal, driving them to the website. Again, I, I keep repeating this to marketers because everybody gets, everybody gets, everybody uh, folds to the pressure of the sales team, which is, oh, we're just going to run lead gen ads. You're going to waste money. You're going to waste time and you're going to give them bad leads. This is the reason why sales does not like marketing and med tech, right? Mm. It's because sometimes we cave too much to the, to the pressure. We know it's not going to work. And when it doesn't work, sales is like, yeah, that's why marketing sucks. So my recommendation to everybody is stand up to sales because sales is not marketing. They should not be driving your strategy. Okay. So again, start with a pain point, drive them to the website. Jonathan, take us over on the retargeting layer, because this is a very important part, because what I hate to say is that everything you just showed us does not happen in our industry. They all start here with running a case study, co uh, a core service or product, a testimonial, right? All these things. Why is that a bad idea? Think about, think about today. Can you remember an ad that you saw for the first time? Can you name one? Can you name two? Can you name three? No. And I do this for a living. That's actually yeah. a really good question. You don't. And the reason is, is that you, you don't, you see so many, you're, you're kind of blind to them at the cold layer, even running at the budget we have right now, someone is going to see your ad maybe once or twice within a month. So you have ability to kind of capture their interests or capture people that notice it, but you're trying to get this to a lot of people at the retargeting layer that ad frequency is going to be much higher. Uh, there's some companies that if I visit their website, I just get retargeted everywhere. In my Gmail, I'll see a sponsored you know, message above. On LinkedIn, I'll see content. On Facebook, on Instagram, on Reddit. 
wherever I go, I'll be retargeted by these individuals. And it's increasing the number of times that I'm being exposed to that brand and to that content. That's exactly what we're trying to do with this retargeting layer. At the retargeting layer, my ad frequency is going to be much higher. Those individuals are going to see much more content for me over the course of that month, which gives me additional opportunities to show them other pieces of content like a case study or expert advice or what they're missing out on or just demonstrating um, you know, why this is different than maybe the status quo or what they're using today. One of the things that's really challenging is getting people to kind of change their mindset or even just be open to something else because you know, change is kind of the enemy mm -hmm. at times. We're very yeah. comfortable with how we do things. So this retargeting layer is a good way to introduce different ideas and pieces of content at a higher frequency over a longer period of time. Got it, and that makes a lot of sense. And I think you know what's what's important to sh to, to to point out here is the importance of discipline because it does take discipline to do this. Because again, and I'm gonna list this out just for people. So, oops, hold on. There we go. That this is uh, right here is step number one. The retargeting is step two, and then this last part is step three. Am I am I right in writing this out? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. And, mm -hmm. and and I just want to emphasize again to the marketers who are watching: this takes discipline because when you launch this campaign, especially if sales knows about it, they're going to start blowing you up, especially if it's. Um, if it's end of quarter or they're on, you know, they're behind quarter, they're just going to keep asking for leads. Don't cave because it screws everything up. And just in general, um, you know, Jonathan, from a, not just a B2B standpoint, but again, for, for med tech, I'm going to use surgical devices as an example. We're talking about, um, a B2B sale that involves multiple decision makers. Um, it, it's minimum ACV on this is going to be at the very, very lowest $50,000, but we're talking about in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So for an ad like this, where the goal is to get somebody to sign up to do a demo, how long would you run a campaign like this? Like, at let's start with step one to get, to get clarity on which, which ad down here to run. What's the minimum amount of time you would run step one for? So you need data to get to step two and you need at least 300 people in order to launch a campaign on LinkedIn. LinkedIn 300, 300, three, oh, 300 people on an audience. In an audience. Ah, LinkedIn yeah. protects user data. So if you have less than 300 people, it will not allow you to run a campaign. Now this can be cumulative. So you can take people that have interacted with your cold ads, people that have visited your website, and you can apply the filter so you're only targeting the personas that you want. But with a strategy like this, and with a you know 500 to 1,000 dollar budget, um, it's gonna it's gonna take you maybe two months ish to get enough data, depending on what your cost per click is, depending on the content, on how engaging it is, before you can get to a retargeting layer, uh, a step two. You need you data, said, and it takes and time just, or money. And you said you said how long? Two to three months. I'd say two to three months. Two to three maybe months. Shorter at this budget. With this budget, yeah. And let's yeah. be clear. Um, step one, the, the initial cold layer, it, it doesn't stop. That will always ah, very be good right. point. Because because there is a thing called ad fatigue, right? Just because one ad your ad's killing it right now, that doesn't mean that you just sit back and just you know let the good times roll, right? You will monitor the ads continuously. You might have ads that are performing at a very high level now, and in, in two months it, it will stop. They will might get ad fatigue at which case you want to put new ads in. And in fact, this playbook does have some direction over when to do that as well. Um, but as far as, as running that initial cold layer, it will always have the majority of the budget and it will always be running and you will continuously monitor it and optimize it for engagement. As ads start to get that ad fatigue, you will infuse new ads, but it will continuously be, bring, be bringing people into your funnel. If you were to shut it off, at any point, you're shutting off the people that are going into your retargeting layer. So you're 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 turning off the water faucet, and nothing else is coming in to to your funnel, right? Mm, so mm -hmm. you can't have that. If you did that, you would have to switch back and forth between turning on that 
that initial cold layer again to bring in more traffic, shutting it off, and then just trying to retarget people. It needs to become an, an evergreen ecosystem where you have new people coming into your funnel. And as they're hitting your funnel, they're then getting retargeted with the type of content that's going to establish that thought leadership and get them to convert to a booked call for you. Got it. A question for you guys. Um, so for example, um, and for the, uh, for the, for the, for the med tech marketers on here who are well, well funded, like post series C, they have a full fledged website and everything. There are marketers on here. I know that, you know, their met, their, their website is okay, but it's not like they have a lot of good content on there. Um, so my question to you is, are they better off sending them just directly to a, a plain website here, even if there's like nothing much except for like just a little information about the company? Or should they send them to an article or, or something that's on their LinkedIn company page and then retargeting that? What, what would you recommend? I think for me, and it's, and it's one of those questions of, you know, people that are using you're saying probably a, a lot of people in this space are running cold lead gen forms and then they're mm -hmm. getting whatever data they can and then re retargeting with lead gen forms. Yeah. So to me, one of the biggest benefits of sending them to the website first is that they get a better look feel for the actual company. So yeah, ide ideally, there would be a website that represents the company well. And Even if it's just a, a simple landing page that gives you like a, a quick overview of who, what, and how the, how they solve a new a new problem. Yeah, because almost almost anything is better than I. The reason one of the reasons I don't like running lead gen forms is because the leads. I mean, you're talking about pissing off sales team. A lead where you capture their name and email, but they've never been to your website, never seen like what your company, what the company is about. They have no idea like what the look feel of that company is like, those are some of the weakest leads, like, and maybe oh, one in 20, like that's what pisses the sales team off. But the only way, like these marketers, a lot of times feel like they can overcome it. It's just by getting more of them because they, you know, they think it's a pure like quantity game, but, and, and then it becomes a different discussion of, well, okay, can we, we can't just stop doing this because if I stop, like if I start this new strategy and send, I have no leads coming in, like then we're really going to piss them off. So what I would say is LinkedIn has LinkedIn has the ability for single um, single image retargeting. So if you're running and lead gen form like retargeting and website visitor retargeting. So even if, um, if, if you just move some of those lead gen forms over to retargeting, like go back and get the website visitors, the company page visitors from 90 days, all the people that have opened lead gen forms and move like, that move a lead gen form and retargeting, those will at least be better quality. So there could be like a transition from like, here's the way you're doing it. Here's the way you should be doing it. And here's like a middle ground of like, okay, we've reduced the number of leads we're getting, but we're improving the quality. And then eventually, you know, we're generating a ton of inbound. The, the amount of leads is down like dramatically, but the quality mm -hmm. is like tenfold. But yeah, to your point, Got the it. And it kind of goes along with like, you know, okay, so where do you send them? Like I would send them to the website if at all possible, because that's mm -hmm. the best way that they get an initial look feel for the company. It's not going to convert that well. Um, I would do that versus the company page. I would think in the retargeting layer, you could send them to the company. Some of the ads could go to the company page. Some of the ads could go back to the website. I send some retargeting ads to my YouTube channel, some to um, you know, a newsletter sign up, like I'll send them, I've sent, I've sent retargeting ads back to an organic post from my LinkedIn profile. So it's not always just about like sending them back to a landing page to convert, Got but it. for the initial cold ad, I would try to get them whatever's going to give them the best look of your company overall. Got it. And, uh, I have, we have a question, uh, two, two interesting questions, one from Reno, one from Simon. And by the way, uh, I don't know if Jonathan had to hop on a client call, but in, in case he, he got kicked off. Oh, he did. Okay. I was like, yeah, in case yeah, he got he kicked did. off and join. So we got this, um, uh, great question from Rena Mishra, who's out of San Jose, California. She's the director of marketing over at SI bone. Rena and I are really good friends. Cause she's actually one of the people, uh, very early on uh, many years ago, saw the importance of digital and she really introduced a lot of a lot of the digital strategies over at SI. So I'm happy you can join. Um, but get ready because we're going to get covered by her question right now. There we go. Yeah, we're going to have to <laughs> peek over. So the question uh, that Rena has is, I tried creating an audience for a specific surgeon type, but
But the more I tried to target, eventually the audience became too small and LinkedIn said I couldn't run the ad. How specific have you been able to target audiences in LinkedIn for Surgeon and other HCP types? Um, I'll, I'll, I can kind of take that just because I can speak to it. And actually, let me, uh, let me leave that question up while I sit up a little bit. So, Rena, that's a great question. So, yeah, so I, I encounter this as well, especially when you're trying to focus on a really specific type of surgeon. Um, say you're trying to look at uh, neurosurgeons who predominantly do, let's say, spine surgery, right, or in, in private practice. You know, the problem with that is that, again, it gets very, very small. So what do you do? What I recommend doing, and let's, I'm going to assume that you're running this within the United States. What I would, what I would say is focus on a broad, uh, a broad, uh, a broad audience. So in LinkedIn, you can select spine surgeon. Okay. But then have really specific criteria such as, um, they, their industry is either medical practice or hospital healthcare or higher education. Those are the three that a doctor is going to fall into biotech med device. That means they're a physician that works in the industry. You don't want that, right? Focusing on those three, right. And then making sure you have some exclusionary criteria. So you don't want like a surgical tech or anything else. Now that's still going to give you a big audience. But then again, I think that's the important thing about running these ads, but make sure this is a very important thing. Two things. Number one, make sure that audience expansion is turned off because that's how LinkedIn says, Hey, if you want spine surgeons, we can expand and find other people like it. We might find people who are, let's say into back pain and they're chiropractors, right? You don't want that. Always turn off LinkedIn audience expansion. And the other thing I would say, and I learned this from impactable is for, um, audience network where LinkedIn runs the ads on other websites. Personally, I turn that off. If you want to run that, just create a second campaign where that thing is on. But I would focus all of it on LinkedIn. And based on that criteria, you'll have a good audience size, right? Because again, you want to see, there's a lot of assumptions we go into with as a marketer. And sometimes we have to constantly test that those assumptions and see, see what happens. But let me let me throw it over to, uh, to just Justin, Josh, and see, see what you guys uh, have to say about that. I, I would make one other um, recommendation. So... Um you might want to invest in, in getting a white list, getting a list of names that you can upload to the LinkedIn platform. Uh, they tend to perform at a much higher level than just using the regular targeting criteria on LinkedIn. And typically when I build a um, campaign where I, where I do have a white list, I usually also run a campaign using the search filters. So that way we're encompassing anybody that you can find in the search criteria in the ad platform and you can upload a whitelist. But when it gets that specific, when you have such specific criteria for, for your target audience or for your ICP that it limits your audience by so much that you can't even run a campaign, then um, you may want to consider getting a list of data that you can upload and instead targeting that, or again, target that with a broader search group on the LinkedIn platform. That way you can compare results and see where you get your conversions from. It's something I wanna, I wanna comment on that. Um, I totally, I totally agree with you, uh, Josh. One thing I want to say, because our, uh, marketers in my industry are prolific for doing this. And again, I marketer, you know, marketers who are watching, this comes from a place of love. I love you guys, but they cave from the sales pressure from the sales team of buying these lists. The problem with these lists, unlike SAS, like in SAS, if you use zoom info or something, you'll, you'll get, you'll get good contacts. That's not what they're going to. They're going and buying an email list from a third party for like four, five, six thousand dollars, <laughs> and it's all work emails. It's garbage, right? Because nobody. I've been doing this for a long time. Ninety nine, ninety eight percent of the people I look at on LinkedIn, doctors, nurses, CEOs, etc., they all register with their personal. What I recommend is do a live, do a webinar, unrelated to your company. Just, you know, let's, so for Rena, I'm going to use Rena as an example. She works with spine surgeons. And so look in the spine surgery world, look at your annual conference and just check and see, ask your doctors, what was the hot topic? Let's just say it was medical billing around spine procedures. Great. Get an expert, do a webinar on that. Forget about whether it's related to your company, because then you'll be able to get a lot of people registered for that via LinkedIn which means you're going to get a lot of personal emails and then you can use that, that list, right? That's, that's what I would recommend. Oh, Josh, go ahead, please. Another option also. So um, 
you know, when you put in the search criteria into the ads platform, it doesn't show you an example of who you're targeting, right? You just have to trust that it's the right people. Um, Sales Navigator, you know, another tool that, that LinkedIn offers, you can put in the criteria and it shows you who's going to be in that list, right? You get to see that, but you also can't just export that data. Um, they do have tools out there, such as Fandom Buster, where you can export the list from Sales Navigator and upload that as a list mm-hmm. to the ads platform. Of course, you need to find someone who, who offers that kind of service, but um, or uh, you can always you know check it out and, and check out the process you can do on your own. But there is ways to be able to pull that list from the LinkedIn platform, from a tool like Sales Navigator, and then use that in your ad account. I think it's a great, it's a great, great, great idea and great point. We have uh, another question. Let me pull that up. And and before we wrap up, I know we kind of, uh, I think it unshared my screen, but I'll um, I'll go back and and show the infographic shortly. But Simon Evans uh, from the UK said that my understanding is LinkedIn doesn't like us to direct people away from LinkedIn and onto websites with this mess with the algorithm. Um, I have a quick answer, but I want I want Justin Josh to take this. Um, that's normally correct when you do organic posts as an individual, but when you are a company and you're paying for it, LinkedIn's going to do what you are paying for, right? So, uh, Justin, Josh, if you can take that. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say too. That that thought that LinkedIn doesn't want you to take people outside the platform is more of a organic uh, kind of deal. And yeah, if you're paying, they really don't care because, like I said, I run ads. I run some crazy experiments with my retargeting ads where I send them to a YouTube channel, to my website, to an organic post on LinkedIn, to um, a podcast. Like I'll send them anywhere and I don't see any kind of difference. Like if I'm paying, they really don't seem to care where the destination URL is. So I wouldn't Uh, say that's something you need to worry about. And that's a, that's a great point, by the way, um, that I want to, I want to highlight, which is, you know, in med tech, I'll use an example of like, well, I don't think you should run ads for this all the time, but like, you know, we spend a lot of money on, on really fancy, uh, 3d videos explaining our product, right? Maybe not that, but let's say a blog or an interview with your founder or something, right? You know, this content costs money. And so my, my thing is that, Hey, you can have the best content in the world, but if you don't have good distribution, it might as well not, uh, exist. And so if, if your founder was on a podcast, Let's say, I mean, I've had CEOs on my, on, on my podcast, The State of MedTech. So for those companies, right, I've done this on my end, but for those companies, I always tell them like, hey, even though this is not a, a podcast owned by your company, your CEOs on this podcast, take the link, make your own graphic and run an ad for a month, pennies on the dollar to make sure that there's great distribution and you drive as much traffic to that as, as possible. Because I think the goal here, again, with content, it shouldn't always be gated, especially now that you can pixel people, you can you can retarget them. If the idea is, hey, this content is great and it's going to indoctrinate somebody into our worldview, let them be able to access that for free without mm-hmm. putting in their information. You know, that's exactly what I usually recommend. I don't like gating content if you have a really good follow up process and, and funnel process built into like collecting an email address or something then okay, use that, maybe get some content and then put them in an email funnel. But typically we're sharing that information to establish your expertise. It should be free thought leadership material. Um, if you get that content and you just take that info and then you use that as an actual sales lead, that's not a high quality lead. They didn't get that content because they were ready for a call. They wanted to invest more time into what you're trying to show them, let them consume that material. And LinkedIn is especially strong for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, I know we have a little bit of time. So um, I want I was going to maybe go and look at um, see if I can pull a couple ads from some companies that I know. Well, um, while you're doing that, Omar, I wanted to touch on something yeah, please, um, you please, said a couple please minutes do. ago. So uh, you mentioned you know, potentially having a company that's well funded, maybe doesn't have the greatest website for people to go to. Um, the first thing I'd, I'd want to say is if it is well funded, you should absolutely invest in your website and, and try to make it user-friendly, conversion-friendly, give people options, make sure there's a phone number, an email address, a contact us form, a calendar link, any way to get them to convert that they're most comfortable with. But I want to talk about outside of that because I have a client who 
had a website he was not happy with. And even though he's the director of marketing, he had very little control in the company on what they could do with the website. So instead, we developed his campaign using HubSpot landing pages. And for the cold campaigns, we use you know pain points off the showed the service that he's offering. And we sent people to these HubSpot landing pages where they could learn more. And there was a form at the bottom, but it got very little conversions. We then retargeted the people going to these landing pages with lead gen forms. And I'm going to suggest this also. If you use lead gen forms, pop a couple qualifying questions in there. It's going to make them higher quality, lead, um, higher quality leads for your sales team. And it makes sure that somebody doesn't just auto-populate the information and submit it without showing any additional kind of interest. So um, we, we sent cold audience to HubSpot landing pages. We retargeted them with lead gen forms. It still takes a while to build up, especially when you're dealing with really small audiences. We had an ABM approach. So we had separate campaigns for um, Sanofi, for Roche, for Genentech, right? We had separate mm -hmm. campaigns for them. So it took a little while to get that 300. Then we implemented a lead gen form that only runs on LinkedIn. And um, after, for them, it probably took us about four to five months to start getting leads in. But mm. once we did, we started getting you know, four to seven leads per month with a service or with a product that starts at $100,000. Um, the, the, the amount he's invested in marketing becomes insignificant when you now have 20, 30 leads from these companies that if we're really high value um, product. So absolutely. No, you no, can absolutely. still work outside the website and still generate leads and still build a good funnel. Still, my first recommendation is going to be invest in that website, make it user friendly, make it conversion friendly. Should you not be able to do that? There are workarounds that you can do. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, I mean, a lot of what you and Justin are mentioning, you know, it, it really goes back to this concept of discipline, you know, and again, if we think about it from a sales standpoint, right? Nobody, whether they're in sales or not, would expect that the very first time you, you meet with a surgeon, that you're going to be able to get them bought in, sold, and they're like, yeah, I'm going to go talk to our CEO right now. It just doesn't happen, right? It's right. The, these things happen in steps and phases, and you have to be patient. Even in sales, you know, there's a saying where if you try and pull the trigger too soon and try and close on a deal, like you lose it, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's the very same thing with marketing, which is if you pay the money to run an ad, that ad is going to get in front of, let's say, that your ideal customer profile that one time for maybe that week, maybe for that month, because you don't you don't know how often they're getting on. Do you want to risk that on just trying to get them into a demo, right, lead gen? Right. Or do you want to make it easy where it's like, oh, here's something that's interesting that A, gets my attention, B, causes me to take an action and click through, and then C, like I get a little, little, little bit of indoctrination, a little bit of persuasion, right? And something I'm, I pulled up some um, uh, uh, ad pages I want to show uh, just as an example. And the, uh, the less transactional that your offer is, the mm -hmm. more educational you want your funnel to be. That's that I, I like that. That's going to be a quote. Um, can you guys see my screen real quick? Yes. Yes. So, so one thing I want to show people that a lot of marketers aren't completely unaware of is that you can go to any company on LinkedIn. Okay. And actually here, I'm going to show one because I think a lot of people would be curious about this. But if we go to, since we have some people who are in the uh, spine orthopedic space, let's go to a multi-billion dollar company. Do Synthes. Okay. So I'm a big fan as a startup marketer of, oh, leave it to LinkedIn to mess up on me. There we go. As a startup marketer, I like to go to companies who have a lot of money, legal, regulatory, and be like, okay, instead of me wasting my time with my legal and regulatory, let's see what they got approved when they got running. If you go to their company page, you click on post, guess what? And this is only on desktop. Actually, you can see this on mobile too. You go all the way to the right and there you have it, the ads. So for Depew Synthes or any company, including my own, you can scroll through and see all the ads they're running. Now, Depew, I'm a big fan of Depew. I think they're a great company. I'm going to take a knock on, on their marketing here, okay? So I don't have any problem with this up here, um, but let's look at this 
image, right? This, this video. Okay. It's great. The problem though is, is this actually going to get attention? Okay. Attune cementless. All right. Maybe, but when it goes to here, this is on a, I'm, I have a 30 inch Mac desktop computer. I don't think anybody's going to see or know what the hell that is on a mobile phone, right? So you have to ask yourself, like, what is this going to look like on a desktop? And for your user, it's like, where my, where's my user going to see this? Probably when they're in the physician surgeon's lounge or in the cafeteria on their phone. So they're not going to see that. And let's just say they do happen to see this. If they click learn more, where does this go? Let's see. Yeah, see, like, like this is this is a this is a waste, right? I don't need like. I work in this industry. I don't even know what the heck that is. <laughs> HPRA registration number. Yeah. So this is just, this is a waste and ad to view the right? page. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll show you a couple companies I worked at. Um, so here's Petro. This is a company I worked at a couple of years ago and they still do a great job, I think with their ads. But for example, if you go to their ads here is, you know, they're big on predictive health and fluid management. So again, very simple headline, uh, uh, Post text monitoring urine output is critical. I like that. They have a see more where what I would say is they probably needed a little extra text so people knew that there was a see more, right? But again, they spend money on this ad or on this video. So might as well pay for distribution on it, right? So that's good. So they're going to be able to get retargeting on this. And then if you click learn more, let's see where it goes. Yeah, it goes to their website so they can retarget it. Perfect. One other example I want to show, and I'm, I'm going to put it back to Justin and Josh in a moment, is Harmonic Bionics, very interesting robotic company that, that I started working with recently. You know, their, their previous ads weren't bad. Like this does get the attention of their ideal customer, right? The problem though is that when it comes to getting a, a demo, they're going straight to a 30-minute virtual demonstration discussion. So when you click to go sign up, it goes to this landing page you have to scroll down and you have to enter your information, right? How did you hear about us? This is great. And then, you know, and then you submit. The problem is that this is just too many steps. One thing I do recommend for all forms, if you're going to capture somebody, always ask, how did you hear about us? Because your attribution, attribution software is always off and you'll be very surprised what you find here. Would you guys agree with that? Oh, for sure. Yes. We've been doing that for a couple of years and I try to do both. I try to, you know, have the channel attribution, but then we have self attribution and then I try to make sense of the two, but it's always going to be a messy game. So this is a really good. Absolutely. Idea. Uh, let me show you, and let me go back and show, I have one question I want to get to before we, we fit, we wrap up because we're almost at top of the hour. Um, so this is the old ad they had, right? Again, nothing wrong with it. The problem is, the goal, the goal was to get them straight into a, a demo and booking time with them. We just pivoted. We showed again, a pain point, right. Of what they solve, right. And there's, this is a patient talking about the issues they have. And instead of having them go and sign up for, to get time for a demo, we, we made them go watch a virtual demo when, which is when they click to see more or to learn more, very simple information. They submit. And then they're immediately able to watch a demo right then and there. And let me stop sharing, come back uh, and just make a point. The reason why I think that's important to, to marketers to understand is at the end of the day, when your sales team does a demo, 90% of that demo is the same demo for every single person. So rather than spending time on, okay, the salesperson gets to do that demo and everything, maybe run a quick two, three minute virtual demo where they can watch it recorded and then book time for a 10 minute follow-up conversation. That's going to reduce sales timelines. Justin, Josh, yeah, your thoughts. And if you disagree, you can you can tell me. By the way, that's totally okay. Thoughts, Josh. I I agree, and um, you know, I I did want to make a comment though on those videos. So typically for um cold awareness videos, you usually want them to be shorter. Um, I agree. That I agree with you. I completely yeah. agree. 30. I would you say would you say even um uh uh choose having an image because it's even faster than a, than a 10, 30 second video. So I, I like images better. They get more clicks. They drive more traffic. Now here's Me the too. thing I've seen about videos though, is if somebody sits and watches an entire video and then clicks, that tends to be a higher quality click. So That's true. They're, they're but you gotta be better. more disciplined about letting that campaign run. Right? Exactly. And you also have to think about it as in um, retargeting. 
you can retarget people based on the amount of the video that they've watched, 97%, 75%. So that's really going to help you supplement your retargeting group for people that you know watch the majority of this video. Um, so you get some higher quality clicks, you get retargeting. I would not want to use video as my main method of driving traffic and my main method of getting conversions. I would use single image ads to drive people somewhere and from there, if you want to have a video that they can watch and they, they can educate themselves more on and even have the ability for them to, to schedule that follow-up, which I have implemented in campaigns, it would be much more effective. Now, and if you retarget people, you can retarget them with longer videos because you know it. they're on that second stage and they're much more likely to watch a little bit longer of a video. Got it. It's kind of that point with the lead gen form, like, I imagine that, yeah, someone who watched 75% of a video that does show like more interest, but if they haven't actually been to your website, then they don't have a great idea of you as a, a whole company. So that also degrades the quality of that lead. Like it's better than a click to a lead gen form. It's not quite as good as a click to the website because then you're retargeting someone who's fully or more aware that you're this, you know, large sprawling organization and not just because I think showing them just your company page or a video or a lead gen form, like creates this small isolated like version of your company. They don't get to, it's the same with like sending them to a HubSpot landing page that that doesn't look or feel like it's connected to a bigger, like I, I think if you send someone to a siloed landing page, it should, it should kind of look and feel like it's connected to the bigger website so that they can at least explore if they want to, because I think it has that. And I would say when you're talking about attribution here, I would really caution people to move the goalposts. If you're just looking um, at cost per lead, like you're going to be fighting an uphill battle to prove this to whoever's, you know, controlling the budget. It should be, okay, you know, we're not going to focus on cost per lead anymore because if you focus on that, you can never switch to this new strategy. So you have to mm. move the goalpost and you have to say, okay, what is the conversion rate of these leads? Like how many of these leads convert to a meaningful qualified conversation. If you can at least move it to that, you have a fighting chance because then you're like, okay, I don't need 20 leads. I need to produce five meaningful conversations with the sales team from this spend. Bingo. That's better. Again, and then that from is... there, how many of those conversations turn into revenue? And when you start looking at it that way, this approach usually does a couple of things. It creates inbound leads that require, you know, that are higher quality, that are more likely to convert into meetings those meetings from leads that are sourced this way have a mm -hmm. higher likelihood to convert to revenue. And then those deal sizes from those that convert to revenue are usually bigger because you've done so much work with trust that when they are ready to move through the pipeline, it's accelerated. So much trust is there that they're willing to, you know, enter on a bigger contract or a bigger deal. So those are the things you that you'd have to kind of align with leadership so that you're not getting judged on cost per lead or LCI. You'll, you'll have no chance of, of moving this. Absolutely. And something I do want to comment again, like, you know, we're talking about med tech companies. They have the budget. I'm a small business owner. I don't care about my cost per lead. You know, my cost per lead is, is high for a lot of people, but you know, what's low is my cost per booked meeting cost per demo. And then my customer acquisition cost. you have to have the full picture. If you just focus on cost per lead, you know, you might be calling it quits, you know, because like, oh, that lead cost is too high. And in reality, it's like, no, but your your ROI on that is like 10, 20, 30 X, you know, um, we have a question I want to bring up. It will be a quick answer because we do have to wrap up since we're top of the hour. I don't mind going extra long, but I do have I do have meetings today as well. And I know you guys as well. And, and th Justin and Josh and Jonathan, you know, for thank you so much for joining. I think we should do this again more often just for the markers. Maybe we do this once a month or once a quarter. But quick question from my friend from the biotech world, Frank Dolan. Frank said, what's the general rule for balancing the addition of qualifying questions in your lead gen form and causing form abandonment uh, to occur? Um, my thing is that unless you really need that that qualifying question, don't put it in there. Um, Justin, Josh, quick, quick answer to that before we wrap up and, and your thoughts. I think it's the amount of, I, I would test. So my answer is it, it, it depends and test. I would start with maybe as little friction as possible and then judge the quality. And maybe you test, cause that's the thing. Like you, if you're getting, if you're getting flooded with leads, but they're poor quality, then that's an indicator that you might need to add a little bit of friction uh. to the process 
And then what makes it through is going to be, you know, less leads, but higher quality. So at that level of friction is what you want to adjust up or down based so on the start data with you're low, saying. Start with low friction. Get get to the point where the problem is, okay, we're getting too many leads. Mm -hmm. How do we add friction? Yeah, right? too many leads and low quality. And then, yeah, add a little friction in the right place to adjust that. So your sales team isn't wasting their time. The quality you're presenting them with is a little better. But yeah, I would say for, for most people listening to this, you'd want to start with low friction and then see if it makes sense to add a little bit. Perfect. Exactly the same Perfect. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining. And for the audience who's watching, I got a couple of nice offers for you. Number one, you'll be receiving an email uh, from Impactable. They're going to have a nice, uh, nice ebook or playbook for you guys. So they'll be sending that to all the people who registered. If you enjoyed this, again, please help us grow the show. Reshare this. Send this. Send this exact. You can send this LinkedIn link to anybody. They can register and rewatch this replay. The other thing I'm going to say, but you know. For those who are watching, you're going to have to move fast on this. So if you head to their website, so impactable.com, you can get a free LinkedIn ads console where they're just going to sit down, maybe give a quick consult on what you're doing and see how they can help you. But go to impactable.com. That's I-M-P-A-C-T-A-B-L-E.com. Click that book a call uh, button. Again, this is the first five people. So I would go right now and do it um, and get time with them. So Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is another edition of the State of MedTech, the marketing edition. We'll be doing more of these, and uh, we really appreciate you all joining the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure you. being here. Thanks, Omar. Take care, everybody. Everybody have Bye, a guys. wonderful week. See you later. Bye-bye.